I'm Fiona Harvey. I'm the Environment Correspondent for the Financial Times. Um, and I'm here to moderate our, our very distinguished uh, panel today uh, to talk about uh, environmental issues in, in the context of trade and where the intersections are between uh, environmental discussions and discussions on trade. I'm sure that you uh, are aware of the uh, findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change last year. Uh, they found that if we carry on uh, business as usual, um, we will be committing ourselves to three degrees of warming. Uh, three degrees may not sound very much, uh, particularly if you live in, in Switzerland and you might think that, you know, warmer summers, warmer winters might be quite a nice thing. However, uh, if you consider that the last ice age was only five degrees colder uh, than our average temperatures today, you can see what a difference three degrees make. There is now a greater consensus, at least on the scientific uh, evidence, that the business as usual path is, is no longer acceptable, that inaction is not an acceptable uh, outcome. Uh, and this if inaction or business as usual will hurt developing countries the most. Uh, and that's why developing countries also uh, need to, to really be proactive in all this. Uh, during the Bali conference, we talked uh, a lot about this. And I think my most memorable moment was as a participant from the uh, South Pacific Islands. He said, please don't take too long uh, to talk about this, because if you take too long, my country will disappear. Uh, and, and that's the, true for the case of Indonesia. If the, the uh, inaction scenario would mean uh, by 2020, 2,000 islands out of our 17,000 islands would disappear uh, with the global warming. So uh, I think that's the, the reality that developing countries will face uh, uh, the, the, the highest costs, but at the same time, they are the ones that have uh, the greatest difficulty in terms of uh, limited resources and capacity to deal with managing the climate change. Trade as a means of development and how to have strategies and policies that lead you to development uh, while at the same time doesn't take you away from the environment uh, objective has become another key uh, interlinkage. And climate change and trade uh, or the, uh, the discussion between trade and environment of course is not a new one. Uh, it's the inconclusive evidence as to whether uh, increased trade leads to in increased environmental degradation because of uh, carbon footprint, carbon miles, and so on and so forth. I think the evidence is still inconclusive because it, it can still go both ways. That openness to trade, there's also evidence that that has led to clean technology use and better environment outcomes. Uh, the debate is still out there, but nevertheless, there's the, the, the interlinkages there. So I think that, that was a, a large part of our discussion was recognizing these interlinkages uh, and recognizing that uh, the mutual supportiveness of these uh, three objectives of trade development uh, and uh, climate change uh, is interrelated and they simultaneously affect each other. Uh, and the major, I think the major conclusion uh, was that unless we had a multilateral consensus uh, on uh, uh, the targets, the climate change targets, and the fundamentals of how you price and measure carbon, uh, you will not be able to come up with the right uh, framework for trade uh, instruments. What are the kind of trade instruments or how does trade uh, support the climate change uh, uh, objectives? I think that was really the major conclusion. Let me try to explain uh, a little bit in detail what, what that really uh, meant in, in our discussions. I think what we, what we observed uh, and what the developing countries especially uh, raised concerns about was the, the growing number of policy reactions in the absence of a multilateral consensus uh, on, uh, on targets uh, as well as uh, how do you price and measure uh, carbon or greenhouse gas effects uh, and so on. Uh, we have countries uh, who have already implemented national plans for energy efficiency, for reducing environment, who, who become afraid either because of competitiveness uh, issues, that their industries become less competitive because they have to pay a higher price, or uh, that they want to force action uh, to other countries that uh, they want to also adopt the same levels of energy efficiency or environmental standards. Or the other argument is that, well, if we have high standards and other countries don't have high standards, what will happen is just migration uh, to uh, the, the countries with lesser standards. Therefore, we need uh, to have 
carbon tax, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So a lot of border uh, adjustment measures have come up uh, in, in the system, some have been implemented, some are in, like in the US Congress, there are already proposals for such uh, instruments. So that's, that's kind of the not so good news. So uh, without this multilateral consensus, develop, developing countries are facing increased risks of such instruments, hindering market access, uh, as well as uh, blocking trade or even worse, uh, be in the name of environment but be disguised protection. What's the way ahead? Uh, let me just close on that note. I think in our discussions, uh, the, the wide agreement was that uh, the, uh, what we have to do in the multilateral trading system needs to be based on the outcome of a multilateral consensus on targets uh, and uh, pricing and measurement of carbon. So uh, it's, it's in a way a sequencing issue. But what do you do in the meanwhile? I think what you do in the meanwhile is that we have to uh, take steps to understand better uh, the interlinkages between trade uh, and environment because here uh, there was a lot of discussion uh, and wide disagreement I would say uh, in terms of how uh, the trade instruments uh, are affecting uh, environment or vice versa uh, how the interlinkages between environment and trade instruments. The other uh, part of the uh, conclusion was that we, we, we really needed to have a, a focus more on the carrot rather than the stick approach to encourage developing countries to do more on climate change issues. Uh, step up cooperation in capacity building and access to clean technology for developing countries. So it's not just uh, looking at mitigation, but how do you uh, facilitate countries in the adaptation side uh, of, of, the, of the issue uh, in climate change. So I think uh, th those were the main uh, conclusions from our meeting. But also uh, a third conclusion was that the WTO needed to engage uh, much more uh, interactively with the UN FCCC processes uh, to ensure that we minimize uh, the potential conflicts between trade uh, and climate change policies uh, going uh, for forward. There is firstly a long term shared vision it is called. It is, it is something it's a, it's, a, it's a vision around in, in, in which way will the de should the world develop when it concerns its carbon future. Um, in this vision, is also, uh, is, there is also an ambition of formulating this 50% this in 50 and perhaps also within the same vision have a short-term goal because without a short-term goal, it's very easy to have a long-term goal if you don't know what does that oblige me to do immediately. Secondly, mitigation. Um, that means setting clear short and medium-term targets for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, including a clear division between comparable efforts by industrialized countries and measurable efforts by developing countries. Now this is, as you might know, um, a very controversial part. Um, many countries um, are, however, coming forward with targets, and this is not, not just developed countries that are doing so. Um, obviously, and this is not a, a, a secret to anyone, um, a big move will have to come politically from the United States uh, otherwise, it will be difficult for major developing countries to, uh, to move on their hand or to contribute. And by the way, also, it will be difficult for other developed countries to move without the United States. Um, the third building block is adaptation. Um, adaptation to the expected climate change that will happen. And as I said, that, uh, that climate change will mostly affect least developed countries and including in the adaptation pillow, pillar is the, is the finance. Who should pay for this? How do we generate money in order to help the least developed countries and the uh, small laying island states to cope with the climate change that will happen in any case? That is a, a big difficulty. Fourth um, building block is finance and investment. 
closely connected to the, to the previous ones, how do we find a, let's, let's say, money machine, some would call it, that will provide predictable financing, especially for adaptation, but also for some mitigation uh, measures. And finally, uh, the fifth building block that we are working with at the moment is technology, with special focus on the need to strengthen climate-friendly technologies um, development and deployment, the penetration of the market, uh, uh, actually both in developed and developing, and developing countries. Those are the, let's say, five problematiques that we are dealing with now. Um, and um, of course, as you can hear, this is closely related to the trade, to the trade agenda in many ways, as well as connected to other agendas development agenda, the social agenda. The one fundamental difference um, now between this round of climate change negotiations and the previous rounds, which led to the Framework Convention 1992 and the Kyoto Protocol 97, is that this, this round of climate change negotiations is seen as an economic negotiation. It's not fortunately a trade negotiation, but it's definitely seen as an economic negotiation. And just to give an example, an illustration of that, of why it's an economic negotiation, when the uh, Doha round stalled earlier this year, um, it was said in the New Zealand press, look, this is, a, this is a billion dollars that New Zealand's got at stake here if this negotiation doesn't succeed. And that just happened to coincide exactly with what New Zealand's then Kyoto Protocol liability was for our greenhouse gas reduction. So it really illustrates that um, looking at further into the future when the scale of the ambition around greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction is going to be even greater, then the economic, what's at stake economically is also even greater. I thought I could probably make the, the best contribution to this introductory session by uh, looking at, from, from my point of view as a negotiator, where, where are the intersections in our negotiations with, with trade issues? or What are the trade, trade type issues that people are talking about? I'd classify them into three categories, if you like. And the one is a fairly obvious category of uh, looking to the trading system or to trade measures for protection. Um, it's not necessarily all, all bad in the sense of protection equals protectionism. Um, but it's clear that if countries are taking on very ambitious commitments themselves domestically to uh, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, and this is imposing costs on the economy, and it's imposing costs disproportionately, of course, on those parts of the economy that are intensive in greenhouse gas emissions. And the issue particularly there, I think, is for countries who are amongst the first movers. Uh, if they are effectively imposing costs on their industries, on their economy, ahead of others, there is a situation of competitiveness at risk. And also, as uh, Minister Pangetsu has pointed out, there is an, an issue from an environmental point of view, potentially the problem of carbon leakage. So that's probably always going to be there and probably a, a it's in a sense a political necessity to be able to um, reassure industries that at least in a transitional period until we have um, a full international agreement, there will be some uh, availability of, of some uh, protection for them. The second category I would uh, identify is uh, trade measures or trade, tra looking at the trading system as coercion. In other words, if the, if the negotiations leading up to uh, December next year look like being a failure, um, an obvious alternative solution might be to say, well, let's to get together a, a coalition of the willing and let's try and coerce through uh, trade measures, through border taxes or other measures. Let's try and coerce the rest of the world who needs to, to come on board and agree to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that, I think, is a very dangerous, would be a very dangerous strategy, and I personally don't think it's possible to um, coerce the, the whole world into, into an agreement. The third category, which is the one that's got the most potential, um, the Minister also mentioned this, but it's also the one that's m the most complex, is looking to the trading system and trading measures for both incentives and support for what we're trying to achieve. Looking to achieve more sustainability in world production and consumption, uh, looking to roll out climate-friendly technologies, because clearly the, the massive transformation that we have to make is, is reducing the dependence on, on fossil fuels, reducing barriers to the flow of that technology.
um, encouraging sensible policies. And again, you can look at a whole range, a very standard range of trade policies and, and analyse them from an environmental point of view and look where the climate friendly and climate unfriendly policies are being applied. And I think you could certainly come up with, a, with, a, with an inventory of um, policies which, which should be looked at to be changed urgently. For example, uh, subsidisation of, of fossil fuels or unnecessary trade barriers to low or climate friendly technology uh, goods and services. So, so I think that the, it's that third category where um, the climate negotiations might really be looking to the international trading system to, um, to be of some help. And we're also looking of course at trying to introduce market mechanisms. Um, the huge amount of finance that's going to be needed, um, as, as Thomas mentioned, is not going to come from governments. It's, they're looking at around about 80% of the finance that's needed to make this transformation to um, a lower emissions development pathways. 80% has got to come from the private sector. So important to get the, the market mechanisms within the <coughs> climate system working properly. The reason why we believe it's serious is very simple. We have a constitution, we have a mandate, which lies in the Marrakesh uh, Agreement of 1994. And this constitution says that trade opening has to serve sustainable development. And that's the reason why we take it so seriously. As other international organizations, we are bound by our mandate and our duties stem from this mandate. And this mandate has to do with sustainable development. The biggest problem in this sort of post-Kyoto negotiation uh, is an issue of fairness, of equity. Huh? Yes, you have countries on this planet who uh, emit uh, one ton of carbon per head and per year, and you have countries on this planet who emit 20 to 25 tons of carbon per head and per year. And this raises a big burden sharing uh, issue, uh, what uh, Marie, uh, quoting the uh, sacred text said, uh, it's a, a common but differentiated responsibility. And the whole problem lies in this, common but differentiated. And how do you cope with that? Who should curb its uh, emissions uh, and by how much is a crucial fairness and equity issue. And my own belief, and I'm very frank about this, maybe too frank for such a large uh, audience, but I, I think we really have to be very clear on this. My own sense is that uh, developing countries, and notably big emerging developing countries who are on the front line of this debate, uh, will not step into commitments which are necessary, without which there is no solution, uh, but which are politically difficult for them, uh, without more trust in the system, without more trust that the rules of the game are balanced in a way that brings them comfort. For most developing countries, the politics of the way around, let's leave all the technicalities aside, are about rebalancing the rules of world trade, which we inherited from previous periods where the balance of forces worldwide were different. They are new balances in today's planet which have to be reflected in the rules of world trade. And if we do not succeed in doing this, public opinion will not believe it's because of a coefficient here or a billion of this here or that. They will believe it is for political reason. And the sort of inability to cope with these new realities will be what a prolongation or a failure of the round will mean for most people. And I think this is where you, Thomas, you talked about political momentum. There is an issue of political momentum there. And I think uh, we really, our first duty 
if we want to help you, is to try <laughs> and do what we've decided to do uh, in between ourselves. Uh, you know, the relationship between uh, trade and climate change is, uh, is a sort of a, it's a string relationship. Uh, with a string, you can pull, but you can't push. Uh, trade can help pulling, but the push has to come from your side.